Worship team. I need to hear that every morning. If I, if I listen to that every morning, imagine how your life would be changed. Oh, he's alive. Wow. He's alive. All right, everyone. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, just as, uh, let you know, Pete and Jerry, they are in Malaysia and Singapore right now. They're uh, training hundreds of pastors and leaders, and so uh, they'll be there for 10 days. And so throughout the course of this week, uh, if you remember them in prayer, just pray for them, that God would uh, give them everything they need as they serve really those nations and those pastors and churches um, in that region of the world. And so just be praying for them. Now, next week, I I'm going to be returning to preach. Uh, and for the next few weeks, as we close out our series through the book of Colossians, and next week, I'm very excited. It's going to be the most important message I've ever preached next week. And so uh, be sure to uh, attend. I say, I say that all the time. It's the most important message I hear, but I believe that this time. And it's really a reflection of what God has been doing in me over the last six weeks while I was away. There were some profound things that took place in my own life, and I'm going to share that and invite you into a way of living, a way of following Jesus in this world. And so uh, that's going to be next week. But today we are we're really in for a treat. About five years ago, I joined Twitter, and one of the great things about Twitter and social media is you become aware of the great churches and leaders around this country and, and around the world. And it was through Twitter that I came across our guest speaker, Eugene Cho. Uh, Eugene is the, the founding and uh, lead pastor of Quest Church in Seattle, Washington. And he's also the founder of One Day's Wages, which is a, a wonderful organization that focuses on alleviating extreme global poverty. And uh, when I heard that Eugene was in town, I, I really wanted him to speak at New Life because I... I I believe God has a word for us through him. And the first service, the 9 o'clock service, I, what, what I suspected to be true was absolutely true. And the reason we bring people in from outside of New Life is because different communities have a different grace on them, a different anointing, a different what we call a charism. And to really grow into who Jesus wants us to be, we invite people from different communities to really impart something into us, to deposit something into us. And so this is why we invite folks from different parts of the world, different parts of our country. And I believe that's going to be a, really a deposit into us individually and a deposit into us as a church family today. And so, uh, it, you know, it's with that that I hope you that you are open to what God is going to be saying to you today. And so Eugene has a passion for Christ that's evident and and he also has a passion for the poor, the marginalized, and, and really issues of justice and mercy, which is near to our heart as a community here at New Life. And uh, what's also cool about Eugene is uh, his, his new book, is, which is being released in September, we have copies of it today. And so you get the advanced copy, okay? Uh, about two weeks advanced, right? And so you get the advanced copy of it. So we, we brought in some books uh, so they're in the resource area. So after you hear him today, you're definitely going to want to pick it up to get the fuller uh, part of what he's talking about today as it pertains to issues of justice and such. And so I found out before the service, before the first service, that Eugene actually had his first, uh, you know, ministry uh, experience in Flushing, Queens. And so he's not unfamiliar with, with Queens, but he hasn't been back to Queens in almost two decades to, to speak here. And so... So we're going to show him a lot of love, all right? And so let's give Eugene a, a Queens Boulevard. New Life Fellowship welcome as it comes out. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good morning again. It's uh, a true joy and honor for me to be here with you. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys know this. I hope you do. You guys have a wonderful church. Uh, you have wonderful leaders and pastors. And I hope that you guys are constantly reminded of God's goodness and grace over your church. Um, uh, your, your pastors, you know, Rich and Peter and Jerry, they've been such an encouragement to me, even from a distance, even though this is the first time that uh, I'm uh, meeting Rich in the flesh, I can now tell him that my Seahawks won the Super Bowl. <laughs> All right? All right? No, just kidding. No, I'm not kidding. They did win the Super Bowl. Um, 
but we banter every now and then on social media because I know he's a big Jets fan. So we'll continue this and reconcile a year later probably. Um, well, let me just share a couple things with you before we hit our passage for today. So I am, um, I was born in Korea, uh, immigrated to this country when I was six years old. I'm turning 44 in a couple months. Um, I am, uh, have recently been going through my midlife uh, reflection, is what I tell people. Uh, that sounds more emotionally healthy. That's what I learned from uh, Pete. And um, I've been married now for about 18 years. My wife is a marriage and family therapist as well, which means that she wins all of the arguments in our home. <laughs> Uh, and we have three children. We have a 15, 13, and 11. So let's pause and pray for me right now. <laughs> no, they're great, amazing kids. And my parents, who recently moved to Seattle from San Francisco, we immigrated to San Francisco. Uh, it's just a crazy story. I have a hard time wrapping my head around this, but they were both born in what is now called North Korea. Uh, back then, when they were young children, there was only one country called Korea. My great-grandfather was one of the first people to believe in Jesus, and I suspect that he thought there would be blessing, and there was, but he experienced great persecution because he came to Jesus. And as a result, he and his wife, my great-grandmother, they decided they needed to flee. They needed to just kind of run away, if you will. And so my father tells me these stories when he was six years old, carrying one of his relatives on his back in the middle of the night, needing to run away, not knowing that a war would break out, eventually separating families and that country into two. Um, it's just a stunning story in many ways. That's a different sermon at some point that I'd love to share with you. Uh, but I am just so, again, honored to be here with you in sharing with you the names of our three children. If you know my children's names, you'll know who I am and kind of the worldview that I have. So let me introduce their names to you. Their names are both biblical and also pop culture references as well, okay? <laughs> So I love the scriptures, and I love to see how the truth of God's scripture can impact our culture around us. So for example, our oldest, 15, her name is Jubilee, Old Testament, Leviticus, God's freedom, God's promise, and Jubilee is also an X-Men character, okay? <laughs> so a couple of you, all right? Um, and uh, our second daughter, she's 13, her name is Trinity, don't judge us. She's not yet seen the film Matrix, but Trinity, theologically, it's about God's identity. And then lastly, our 11-year-old son, his name is Jedi. Jedi, all right? Yes, a couple Star Wars fans here, okay? So I'm a big Star Wars fan. Okay, I'm a big Star Wars fan, and Jedi comes from Solomon's Hebrew name, Jedediah, which means the chosen beloved, God's chosen beloved. It's a beautiful name, beautiful name, and uh, many people suspect that George Lucas got names and themes from the scripture, right? It's pretty clear. And when I share with people that my son's name is Jedi, inevitably some young men after a service, they always come up to me and they'll say, Pastor Eugene, um, how did you convince your, your wife to name your son Jedi? <laughs> Teach us, O <oh> Yoda. <laughs> okay? So, because Glenn, you still have time, I want you to learn the ways of the force, all right? <laughs> I went to my wife when we found out we were having a son, and I said, can we name our son Jedi? And she said, no. <laughs> so I said, can we name our son <laughs> Jedi? <laughs> and she said, no, okay? So about eight and a half months into our pregnancy, I finally figured it out. So I went to my wife and I says, Min He, I love you. That's not the trick. That's not the trick. So I said, I said, you know, 
I realize it's only fair, only right, only just that you, the mother of this child, you, the one carrying this baby in your womb, you should be the one to choose his name. Smile comes across her face. She's just so happy. So I said to her, here's your choice. (laughs) It's Jedi or Frodo. One of these two. One of these two. And I am so glad that she chose wisely. Because Frodo Cho just does not sound right, okay? If you have your Bibles with you, your phones with you, I want to ask you to turn with me to the Old Testament. And we're going to read from Amos in the Old Testament. And Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, and what I'd like to ask you to do is just find it, mark it, place your finger there, and then I'm going to come back to it. But I want to give you a little bit of a context to this about what we're going to read, because once you hear the context, it'll make that much more impact and sense. Uh, In today's world, when you call someone prophetic, it's kind of meant to be a compliment. Like this person has a prophetic voice. It's, It's an encouragement. But I want you to realize because Amos was a prophet, back during the times of the Old Testament, during the times of the scripture, if you were a prophet, you were hated. You were vilified, you had no friends. People basically saw you as a loser. Now, I need you to know that. Because for, for us, for us as Christians, we need to realize that our calling to be followers of Jesus is not necessarily because we want to be well-liked and well-received by every single person. Our calling as followers of God is to be faithful to Jesus. And that means sometimes we might be well-received. On other occasions, it might mean that we'll not be well-received. There's a distinction about living for an audience of everyone rather than living for the audience of one. Now, A.W. Tozer was the one that kind of marked that phrase, that we live for an audience of one. So Amos was a prophet, and he was not necessarily well-known. Like today, if you ask the modern church, who are some of the more well-known prophets, I guarantee you Amos probably would not be in the top three, top five. You mentioned people like Isaiah, for example. But here's Amos. He was a prophet around the time, around 750 B.C. I'm giving you some general numbers. And he was prominent during the reign of King Jeroboam II. Now, before Amos becomes a prophet, he has a job or he has a couple jobs. He was not wealthy. He was not middle class. He was a simple commoner who had a heart for God's heart. But before he becomes called by God to prophetic work, he had two parts to his job. One, he was a shepherd, and two, he was a farmer. He tended to sycamore trees, okay? That was what he did. Now, I want you to realize, I'm not trying to discount your jobs, your resumes, your expertise, but those are not the most important things, I believe that your jobs matter. I believe your gifts and your passions matter. But the most important thing is our obedience to God. So here's Amos. You look at him, and I would tell you, you wouldn't look at your kids and say, I want you to just be like Amos. I want you to just be like a shepherd, which was considered a very low-tier job, if you will. I want you to be a farmer tending to sycamore trees. That's not the way that our human perception operates. But nevertheless, God chooses people not based upon our skills, our prowess, our pride, our giftings, our jobs, our resumes, our degrees. He looks at our heart and our willingness to say yes. 
Discipleship, if you were to ultimately define it in one word, I would say it's yes. It's obedience to God. It's obedience to the Holy Spirit. So God calls Amos, this guy, shepherd, farm boy, if you will, and he responds. Now, here's a little bit more context. He was born and he lives in a city, a town called Tekoa. Tekoa is somewhat close to a well-known city called Jerusalem. He lives in the southern region of where much of the scripture takes place in a region called Judea. As a farmer tending to sycamore trees, he had a product to sell, a produce, if you will. But the market for his produce was up north. And that's really where his story kind of really evolves. Because as he takes his produce up north, he begins to encounter people. He begins to see things. He begins to witness and he begins to realize something is definitely off. And what he begins to see is he sees this amazing disparity between the have and have nots. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to have everything on equal levels, but what he began to see, including people who profess with their lips, who would often pray out in public, who would go to temples to worship Yahweh, these people who were religious, who were part of the haves, were actually exploiting the have-nots for their own profit and gain. And then they would create a theology to explain why that was taking place. And this caused grave, grave heartbreak for Amos. Because in his mind, there was this disconnect not only between the have and have nots, but he saw this disconnect because his understanding of God was that God's heart, God's character was that God loved the poor, that God loved the marginalized, that God loved the outcast as well as loving the entire world. This is when he begins to have dreams. There are three dreams that are recorded in the book of Amos. So sometime this week, if you have time, make time, read Amos, and read about those dreams. Eventually, as he has these dreams, he goes to this one particular temple called Bethel Temple, and he cannot contain it anymore. God speaks through Amos, and he begins to say these words. Now listen to the scripture from Amos 5, verses 21 to 24. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Now, it was not well received. A prominent priest by the name of Amaziah threatens his very life and basically wants to kick him out, not just of the temple, not just in the region, but want to actually banish him from the country. So again, what I'm telling you is that for many of us, we love doing certain things or we love the idea of following Jesus until there's a cost. Now, I want you to know now, I want to warn you right now, there is a cost to doing justice. There's a cost to fighting for fairness for all people. There is a cost even to discipleship. There's a cost to following Jesus. This is why I love how Jesus, he doesn't mince words. He's not a bait and switcher. He says, count the cost, carry the cross, and follow me. There are blessings, but there are costs 
for us to follow Jesus. Now, when you read this passage from Amos, it's possible that part of your brain might be thinking, is this guy coming into our church and is he criticizing our church? Because you've got a great worship team, you've got a building, there's programs, you've got rules of life with slogans and so forth. I'm not suggesting that these things in itself are bad or evil or not God honoring. Our church, we have the same things. Our church, we have preachers, we have a great worship team, we have phrases and slogans that have weight and substance to us. We also have a building, we have a cafe. These things are important to us. What Amos is saying though, is that right now, what we're doing right now, if the totality, if the fullness of our worship is only contained in about 90 minutes, then something is egregiously wrong. What Amos is saying is what we're learning, what we're singing, what we're, what we're reciting, what we're hearing, what we're proclaiming, if these things are not impacting us, informing us, transforming us in such a way that it impacts our marriages, our relationships with our parents, our children, our neighbors, our enemies, our neighborhoods, our cities, and the larger world, if it's not impacting it in some way, if you don't believe Believe that once you exit those doors, true worship continues once you exit those doors. That's what Amos is saying. Because if the totality of our worship of God is in this space, then I'm telling you right now, this is just a show. I'm just a hired speaker. These are just musicians. And it becomes about how do we put on a good show? How do we entertain people? I'm not suggesting that the excellence of our music and our preaching and our phrases and our facilities, I'm not suggesting that those things aren't important, but man, they're simply more of a gateway to a life transformed, and thus we become light and salt. And this is what Amos, what God is saying through Amos. Of course, God hates detests, cannot stand these religious gatherings if it doesn't ultimately draw people closer to the character of God. So why does justice matter to God? Well, we have limited time today. I want to just share a few things to help us be deeper, more prayerful, more thoughtful, more theological in our understanding of justice. Justice and our pursuit of justice and our love for justice should not be pursued because it's hip or trendy or glamorous, nothing like that. The most critical part about why justice ought to matter and why it matters to your church, why it matters to your pastors, why it matters to your leaders because justice reflects the character of God. Now, if I were to tell you God is love, all of us would say amen because we believe that you cannot extract love from the character of God. You cannot extract holiness from the character of God. You cannot extract, have some kind of a surgical procedure where you take out grace and mercy from the character of God. In the same way, my point is, what Amos is saying is, God is just. Justice reflects the character of God. Fairness reflects the character of God. Isaiah 61 verse 8, I, the Lord, your God, love justice. This is the character of God. This is why we pursue justice because justice ultimately is about discipleship. And all of us are called to become deeper followers of Jesus. Or let me put it another way. Justice is worship. It's one of the ways that worship God. 
Singing, preaching, reading scriptures, what we do here is important, but your, your, your community development organization, the ways that you're engaging your neighbors, the poor, those things are also worship. Now, I think, I know your church, you get it. I get it. I love justice. But as I shared earlier, I think my confession is that if we're not careful, we'll actually become more in love with the idea of justice. Like if I were to ask you right now, who here hates justice? Like no hands would go up. Because as Christians, we know that's the character of God. But there's a distinction between loving the idea of justice and living justly. It's not just about our theology, not just about our knowledge, but it begins to inform and transform us in such a way that it's not just about the idea of it. Let me give you an example for some of you who are having a hard time tracking along. I love exercise. Okay, let me be more honest. <laughs> I love the idea... I, I, love, I, I love the idea of exercise. Now, you understand what I'm trying to say? True story, here are my confessions. I had a gym membership for over 10 years. I went once. Every time I said, ah, it's only 15 bucks a month, I'll go next month, I went once. I have two treadmills. One in the basement that I just got through someone who gave it to us, and then one in our living room. I've been on it maybe twice the past few years. I have a, a thigh master, <laughs> an ab buster, a butt buster. I love the idea of exercise. You know, I actually brought running shoes. To, uh, our family and I were on vacation. And we're about to head home, but I brought running shoes, thinking, in my mind, I was like, oh, we're staying in an empty apartment in East Manhattan. And I thought, oh, it would be so amazing to wake up early in the morning and run down Fifth Avenue and to go by the Empire State Building and say hi to Alicia Keys. It would be so amazing. <laughs> and it's because I'm in love with the idea. Now, do you know how many calories you lose thinking about exercise? <laughs> It's not a trick question. It's zero. But you see what I'm saying? For us as Christians, the danger is that if we're not careful, we're going to end up playing church. And I say this not because we get it, but because that's the struggle we're having as a church. We got our building. We got 800 people, we got a great worship team, I got Pastor Brenda Salter McNeil on our staff, we can just play church. And God says, I hate that game. So it has to be more than just the love of the idea of justice. So what does a robust theology look like? Well, here's, here's three or four things. One, you do it because it reflects the character of God. In doing justice, you learn more about God. You become more godly. That's why we pursue justice. The second reason is that you gotta care. You gotta care. Now, I, if I offend you in some way, I apologize. Another way of defining justice is give a damn. Care. I get it. When you read the newspaper, watch the news, surf the web, gosh, the past few months have been intense. Kidnappings in Nigeria, uh, the, the situation in Iraq, refugees in Syria. There are over 1.4 million children refugees impacted because of Syria. But you don't have to look far. You can just look here in Elmhurst, in Queens, in New York, in Seattle, it's all around us. But here's one thing. 
Oftentimes, Christians and people in general, we can get so overwhelmed that we become paralyzed. Now, I want to let you know this very clearly. Our job is not to save the world. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. Our job is simply to be faithful and to obey. Every single day as God nudges our hearts around situations in our work, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and on occasion things around the world, our job is to simply have ears to listen and the courage to say yes, to hear. So you got to care. Here's the third thing that I want to share with you about what's important is that you got to look at people in the eyes. Now, why is this important? Because if you don't understand that the person sitting next to you right now, in front of you, behind you, or even the people that are living under the oppression of injustice or marginalization, at the end of the day, the most important thing is every single human being is created in the image of God. And we have to look at people in the eyes. Jesus does some amazing miracles. The stories, though, that still captivate, compel me, are the moments he stops and he looks at people in the eyes. That woman who's been suffering through internal bleeding in her mind, she's thinking, if only I can touch Jesus, I will be healed. She touches Jesus and she's healed. But Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Now, I need you to know, it's not that Jesus didn't know. He's Jesus. He knew. He knows, but he wanted to stop, to make it a point, a teachable moment that gives us a glimpse of God's kingdom that in the midst of being hurried and busied and wanted and pursued, that he would pause and look at this woman and say, you have been known by many people as unclean, as dirty, as unworthy, as marginalized, as forgotten, but I see you. The reason why we have to look at people in the eyes is that if we don't, we're going to reduce people into projects. The poor are not projects for the church. It means that as much as we have things to teach, it also reminds us that we have things to learn. Now our time is limited. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up here. And as we close, I I wanna share a story with you here. Uh, Years ago, I was uh, reading a uh, magazine. Uh, You know what that is? You flip pages. It's, it's, It's great. So I'm reading a magazine called National Geographic. I love outdoor magazine stuff, nature magazines. And it's the article about the art of trapping monkeys in Africa. It's kind of a brutal article. And these hunters, they'll go to East Africa where there's a high density of monkeys, and as they go to the spot, they'll gather like hundreds of coconuts. And as they go towards the space, they'll drill a really small hole in the middle of the coconut. But they won't drill straight through, okay? They'll excavate the coconut, and then they'll pour sweet fermented rice in the middle of the coconut. They'll then tie it with rope, and they'll tie the ends of the rope on trees, so the next thing you know, you've got hundreds of coconuts suspended in air all around. The hunters go away, the film is rolling, and the next thing you know, the monkeys descend, and then they begin to draw closer to these coconuts, okay? I'm not sure why I'm walking like this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm committed to the story here, okay? I'm giving you my best. And so they'll get to the coconut, and then they'll shove their paw into the middle of the coconut, barely. They'll grab as much sweet rice as possible. They then try to take out their paw, and it's stuck. They swear in monkey language. 
but this is church. And I'm reading this article, and I'm getting really emotionally invested. I'm like, monkey! Let go of the sweet rice! My kids are staring at me at this time. But here's the kicker. They will not let go of the sweet rice because they place more value on the sweet rice than they do on their own freedom. Now, I'm not here to make enemies. I'm suggesting that it's possible that you and I can also exhibit that kind of behavior, that we're grabbing onto things rather than pursuing the character of God. So here's Amos. And he tells these people, you're grabbing onto these things and you're seizing onto them so hard that we're neglecting and per stop pursuing the character of God. Why is justice? Why is mercy? Why is love? Why is grace? Why is truth so important? Because they reflect God's character. God, this is our prayer today that you would encourage my brothers and sisters here at this church in New York. Give us the courage and boldness to relinquish the things that sometimes enslave us and help us to pursue your heart, your character, and your kingdom, which are meant to liberate us. Help us to simply not just love the idea of following you, not just to love the idea of justice, but God, to live them out by your grace. God, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen.